Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Good evening and thank you for joining us this Friday night. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. We begin tonight with Hurricane Fiona. The Category 4 storm is making its way up the Atlantic and leaving a path of destruction in its wake. 100 mile an hour winds, rain and flooding ripped through Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Turks and Caicos and Bermuda this week. And now the superstorm has its sights set on Canada as it's set to make landfall later this evening. The U.S. National Hurricane Center categorizing Fiona as a powerful post-tropical cyclone and Canadian officials issuing a hurricane watch over widespread coastal areas like Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland. The storm will not make landfall in New Jersey but will inflict near gale force winds, dangerous rip currents and waves on our shores this weekend. With hundreds of thousands of residents now out of the eye of the storm but still without power, clean water or places to sleep, Rebuilding what was lost is their primary focus. FEMA and the National Guard both making efforts on the ground in Puerto Rico after President Biden declaring a major disaster declaration for the territory. And Governor Murphy now deploying dozens of state troopers to Puerto Rico to assist with everything from traffic control to specialized emergency services. The governor thanking those deploying today in New Brunswick where the Puerto Rico Commission lawmakers and advocates hosted the annual Hispanic Resource Fair. Some 40 government agencies with bilingual staff providing job opportunities, helpful resources and vital information to ensure every member of the more than 2 million members of the Hispanic community is able to take advantage of the best of what New Jersey has to offer. It is an explicit statement on behalf of our administration how highly we value this community and how we acknowledge that while we do a lot of things that, that benefit many communities, including the Hispanic community. This is an example of a specific rifle shot into the community. This is explicitly for the Hispanic community in this state. When you say Hispanic or Latino, you have a big umbrella with lots of communities that fit in under that umbrella. And we wear all of that as a badge of honor. So you've had my back, I promise you. We have your back and we always will. New Jersey, like other parts of the country, is seeing a rise in viral infections sending children to the emergency room. We've heard from at least one doctor in the RWJ system that there are little to no pediatric ICU beds available in the area because so many kids are hospitalized with the rhinovirus or enterovirus right now. The State Department of Health issued an advisory last week to warn pediatricians in hospitals about an influx of children entering hospitals coughing and short of breath. The warning comes as social distancing measures have dropped and most children are now back to school and learning fully in person. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan spoke with parents whose children have contracted the rare but serious infection. I'm trying to just, you know, get the word out as much as possible because it, it's scary and um, this is happening. Matasha and mom Kelly O'Neill says her son Owen came down with what she thought was a simple cold, but within hours, the three-year-old began gasping for air. O'Neill started counting Owen's breaths per minute, something she learned to do when the toddler had pneumonia last year. And then when it got to 40, I told my husband, I said, we need to go to the hospital. Um, and we were convinced that it was pneumonia again. They rushed Owen to the ER where doctors immediately put him on oxygen. He tested negative for pneumonia, negative for COVID, but positive for rhinovirus and enterovirus. State officials say Jersey's experiencing a surge of pediatric cases for both diseases, sending so many kids to the hospital that in some areas they've run out of pediatric beds. Alarmed, O'Neill posted a warning about her son's labored breathing on a Facebook group page for Matuch and Moms. I only knew to look for those belly breaths because of Kelly's 
host. Angela Sielski says her three-year-old son, Polly, recently spent four days in a crowded pediatric ICU after a harrowing rush to the ER. Polly had played soccer on a Saturday afternoon, but he started coughing. Within hours, started struggling for air. His mom gave him an asthma treatment and recorded her son's fast belly breathing for a Facebook post. I went from a strong three and a half year old playing soccer to being on forced oxygen and being admitted to the intensive care unit in one weekend. This thing was a monster that crept up on us faster than I could believe. On uh, September 15th, the New Jersey Department of Health put out an advisory to let people know that we were definitely seeing an increase of respiratory illnesses in children throughout the state. New Jersey Deputy Health Commissioner Dr. Meg Fisher says an unusually strong wave of pediatric rhino and enterovirus cases is straining hospital capacity across the nation. Pediatric units in some New Jersey hospitals are at capacity. The number of hospitalizations has increased more in northern New Jersey than in uh, southern New Jersey. Um, And we are very closely monitoring to be sure that we have enough um, pediatric intensive care beds. So the Hospitals are all talking to each other. Kids who require higher level of care uh, will be accommodated at sites where there is ICU capacity. So yes, that might mean transfer uh, if there is no bed availability at a particular facility. Dr. Uzma Hassan of RWJ Barnabas Health, an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News, notes the CDC also warned that in rare cases, the enterovirus strain D68 can lead to acute flaccid myelitis, causing polio-like muscle weakness and paralysis. The CDC reports only 14 cases have been confirmed nationwide, 40 are under investigation, none in New Jersey. Doctors are warning families to be vigilant. The viruses start with basic cold symptoms, but kids can decline rapidly. Kids who are asthmatics or who have underlying chronic lung disease are at risk for severe illness. Make sure that you're adequately stocked on their inhaler supplies and recognize signs of breathing difficulty in your child. Why aren't people, you know, kind of shouting this from the rooftops like parents? Why aren't, you know, parents kind of warning each other? Because I really do think that We were lucky with Owen because we were able to catch it. The good news, both Owen and Polly are on the road to recovery. The season for these types of viruses generally runs through November. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The fiery contest for the 11th congressional seat is getting even hotter. Incumbent Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill and her opponent, Republican Paul DeGroot, exchanging heated remarks over abortion rights. Both candidates calling each other extremists and accusing each other of spreading falsehoods. Senior political correspondent David Cruz analyzes where each candidate really stands on the abortion issue as a midterm election is just under seven weeks away. I'm Paul DeGroote and I'm running for U.S. Congress. That's Paul DeGroote, unfiltered. The former prosecutor turned GOP candidate for Congress is doing his best, his campaign says, to bypass the Jersey press in order to reach voters directly. That's definitely the M.O. Go around the gatekeepers of the press, push your message out unfiltered on social media, attack on social media, do some advertising and uh, work your base. Stiles says it's a strategy that allows for a decidedly smaller audience of a more reddish hue. And for DeGroote, has the benefit in his campaign's mind of clarifying his stance on key issues, in this case, abortion. Here we go again. Mikey Sherrill does what scared politicians do, lie. She's lying about my position on abortion because she wants to hide how extreme she is on this issue. Let me be clear. I support a woman's right to choose through 20 weeks of pregnancy, just like a majority of New Jerseyans. But Mikey Sherrill, she's way out there. But the group's position on a national abortion ban, something the GOP promises to shoot for if they take back the House in November, that is a little less clear. When pressed on it recently, the group clapped back at the press for obsessing over an issue that he says most voters in New Jersey rank well below the economy. Democratic strategist Julie Reginsky says getting to the root of the group's belief is part of what elections are all about. 
Look, when you don't have a good answer to give and you're out of step with where people are in the state, you blame it on the media and you and you run away, right? Because you don't want to answer tough questions. But I really do think that he and, and Mikey Sherrill both and every candidate running for office in New Jersey on either side of the aisle owes their voters the answer of how they will cast a vote on a woman's right to choose. It's not a gotcha question. These votes will come up. And that explains why incumbent Mikey Sherrill has continued to pound the Groot on this issue. When I found out that Paul DeGroote supports states being able to ban abortion without exception, I was terrified. Women will die because of the policy that Paul DeGroote supports. He's been pretty clear. He said he wants to leave it up to the states. Um, he said, you know, let Alabama do what Alabama wants to do. But, you know, I think the difference here, the very clear difference between his position and my position is that I believe strongly that this should be a decision between a woman and her doctor. If there is room for nuance on this issue, the Groot has decided that he doesn't want to acknowledge it and has, as a result, decided not to speak to the press anymore, except for hand-picked conservative outlets, which leaves us with unfiltered Paul de Groot, which we have now filtered, as the free press is wont to do for all sides, especially come election time, when what a candidate really believes is what voters really want to know. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And a reminder, if you are one of the 900,000 who requested a mail-in ballot, they will be in your mailbox early next week. Check out Colleen O'Day's article on everything you need to know on how to vote in the midterm election. And if you're looking for candidates' profiles or whether you're registered to vote and who's running in your district, head to njspotlightnews.org and click on the NJ Decides 2022 tab. Environmental advocates are holding three rallies today in New Brunswick, calling on Governor Murphy to stop all progress on natural gas projects in New Jersey. And for Congressman Frank Pallone, chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, to oppose a measure proposed by Senator Joe Manchin that would speed up the approval of new energy projects, including oil and gas pipelines. More than 100 advocates protested outside Pallone's office in New Brunswick. Among the crowd were students from Rutgers University who chanted and helped held up signs demanding more green infrastructure and the use of solar panels on campus. The proposed measures include language that would be folded into a government spending bill that needs to pass by next week to avoid a shutdown and is part of a deal Manchin struck with Senator Schumer to get the Inflation Reduction Act passed this summer. The congressman thanking the group for demonstrating, saying, quote, I have stood shoulder to shoulder with environmental activists during my entire career and will oppose initiatives that will weaken our historic accomplishments. In our spotlight on business report tonight, Governor Phil Murphy has conditionally vetoed legislation seeking to improve working conditions for many temporary laborers in New Jersey. Among the recommended changes that Murphy sent back to lawmakers on Thursday is a call for $1 million to be appropriated for the Department of Labor and Workforce Development to ensure the robust enforcement of proposed labor protections for the more than 100,000 temporary workers in the state. Other changes sought by the governor would bolster the administration and effectiveness of the new regulations that were included in the original bill. Murphy saying these workers are critical for the state's economy. Budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer is here with me to break it all down. John, so ultimately, what does this mean for Jersey employees and employers? Yeah, Raven, so I think when it comes to the groups that will be impacted, it really depends on whether you're one of these temporary uh, workers or temp laborers, as they're often called, or if you're a business, whether you run a temp agency or you have a business that you know works regularly with employees who come from temp agencies, and so you know the the, the bill itself calls for some major changes to the labor standards for temporary workers, uh, changes related to pay, working conditions, really things that the sponsors of the bill say are long overdue, and really um, protect a group of workers which looks to be more than 100,000 people in New Jersey from having to work in unsafe conditions and also um, oftentimes resulting in them may, maybe being shorted in pay or other things. And so for the workers themselves, it's a really big deal. You know, John, I wonder if the pandemic kind of shed light on those issues. 
You know, absolutely. And, and so what we saw and what we hear from the groups that have been pushing for these changes is that these are workers that throughout the pandemic stayed on the job. You know, a lot of them are performing, uh, you know, work in a warehouse or somewhere where you can't do that from home. Mm -hmm. And so certainly some of the issues that we saw during the pandemic have brought more attention to this area. And that's probably why we, we see it, you know, get this far along in the legislative process. And what has the reaction been from legislative sponsors and advocacy groups? What you've heard from the sponsors since the conditional veto came out has been, uh, you know, it's been well received and, and they've promised to, to work to get the changes that the governor wants to see done. And one of them is adding funding for enforcement of the new standards, you know, right. lawmakers have the power to appropriate. And so we've really heard from the sponsors and, you know, immigrant advocacy groups and labor groups who want to see this passed right away. Not everyone's on board with this. It has received pushback. That's right. We, we, you know, business groups have been against uh, this this proposal for, you know, all along. And, um, you know, they, they may have taken some solace in, in this not becoming law yesterday, but at the same time, they still have some big concerns. Uh, namely, there are some compensation issues that the bill covers that would provide parity for temporary and full-time workers. Some of the business groups say that that's unworkable. You know, when you think about something like a 401k, um, there are also concerns about legal exposure. And so, you know, it was there were tight votes in both houses when this went through the first time. With these changes from the governor, we'll have to see whether any of the opponents um, can make some ground and, and stop this from, from ultimately becoming law. Excellent reporting. Thank you, John, once again for joining me. You're welcome. After the Fed announced another rate hike midweek, the markets dropped. But here's a look at how they closed on this Friday. And make sure you catch NJ Business Beat this weekend with Rhonda Schaffler. She looks at the post-pandemic workplace and why working from home may be here to stay, with important insight for employers on how they can get ahead of so-called quiet quitting. That's Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on NJPBS. More than 100 Newark residents are hearing a little better these days thanks to the Miracle Ear Foundation. The organization teamed up with the Newark Miracle Ear stores to donate 150 hearing aids to those in the area who might not otherwise be able to afford the devices, which can cost anywhere between $1,000 and $4,000. Hearing aids can also be cost prohibitive since neither Medicaid or Medicare covers hearing aids or exams for fitting hearing aids, meaning patients pay 100% of the cost. Melissa Rose Cooper has more on the special event. Neil Black has been dealing with hearing loss for years. He believes his issue started back in the 70s when he used to go to rock concerts. Then we didn't wear earplugs because we didn't know about these things then. The effects on his hearing taking its toll, making it difficult for Black to engage in some conversations with his family and friends. I had to have people keep on repeating what they were saying because I didn't, I missed different things and you know at times it was confusing because you're not hearing everything that everybody's saying but especially with the little ones I have a lot of uh, great nieces and nephews and you know the little ones you know you want to hear each thing that they say because it's so cute but thanks to this little device he's now hearing more than he might want to I joke around and I say to everybody you can't say stuff under your breath to me anymore because I hear everything um, I hear everything that everybody has to say, and it's, you know, I, I just feel normal again, 100%. A life-changing difference made possible by the Miracle Ear Foundation. The organization has been gifting hearing aids for the last 30 years to people across the country who normally would not be able to afford them. And so we cater to their needs and their wants so that we can fit them appropriately and we continue our services with them throughout their journey and their hearing impairment. This event at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Newark is part of a three-day initiative targeting people in the community who are in need. Regional Manager Elizabeth Waldron says they expect to gift about 150 people with new hearing aids. It's important because in any communities, people who have hearing impairment, they have less of an ability to find a, a good job and, and basically communicate with their family members. So we're here to help them to promote that and give them a better quality of life. According to the CDC, roughly 15% of Americans 18 and over have some trouble hearing. 
adults between the ages of 60 and 69 have the greatest amount of loss. And while many age 70 and older could benefit from a hearing aid, less than 30% have ever used them. Miracle Ear citing cost as one of the major reasons with the average hearing aid going for thousands of dollars. It's also the reason why Black, who's retired and living on a fixed income, never looked into getting one before. And when I told the manager who was the same person that was giving my, my hearing test, he said that, you know, we have a foundation and, you know, I gave them my uh, W-2 form with my income and uh, I was able to uh, get them. It's really inspiring to be here to see people who um, didn't necessarily know if they needed hearing aids and to um, see their eyes light up when you put those hearing aids in their ears. We have people that cry because they are so excited to go home and interact with family. Um, they're excited because they felt so isolated, because they've been left out of conversations because they can't engage. And so what we're giving them is an opportunity to experience all the emotions of sound and to re-engage with family and friends and, and even in the workplace. A gift Black says is helping him create new memories with the ones he loves and a gift he'll forever be grateful for receiving. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Before we leave you tonight, the next episode in our 21 digital film series is now online. The series examines the simple question of does where you live in the state affect how you live? 21 profiles one person in each of our 21 counties and looks at the social determinants that affect the person's life. The latest film introduces us to Cindy Aronclew from Somerset County. She's the executive director of Raritan Headwaters and envisions a future where clean water is accessible to all. Cindy engages her community and arms them with educational tools to protect this critical resource. Anchor Brianna Venozzi chatted with her. Take a look. Cindy, I want to ask you about the time that you moved away from New Jersey to the Midwest mm -hmm. and then came back. Why was that pivotal uh, to your role in conservation now? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I grew up in this beautiful part of Somerset Hills along the North Branch with um, my playground with meadows and woods. And I left, um, of course, to go to college. And then I had a short stint in Manhattan. And I moved to the Midwest for almost, um, or a little over a decade. So I returned in the mid 80s and there was a lot of change. Um, 78 had been completed, the pharmaceutical and communications companies had moved mm. out and there was a lot of new development, which was a bit of a shock. Yeah, and so is that what really propelled you into becoming interested in conservation? Yes, you know, I, I was always an outdoorsy person. You know, I, I loved everything about nature, but um, the change really was a wake-up call. I really thought it was time to get involved. I began volunteering at um, Raritan Headwaters, which was the upper Raritan watershed in the South Branch at one time, but um, I got started there on a volunteer basis and just got completely passionate about their mission and luckily um, started working there. A lot of, of your work has to do with helping people understand the connection between what they do in their own home mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the water that we all drink. Why is that so key to this for you? Oh, well, it's key because everybody plays a role in protecting the health of the environment and so uh, the education and outreach and really engaging citizens and arming them with information from children to adults, um, we can all make a difference. And, and we do things in our backyards and in our households that really uh, we don't mean to, but sometimes we're posing a threat to the water quality or um, the land. And I think the education really does wake up people and they understand that there are different ways to do things in a do things in a more organic and wholesome way with that understanding that everything you do on the land um, ends up in the water. What's your vision uh, for what you want to achieve, um, not just for your hometown, for your slice of land, but for the state and the environment as a whole? Mm. Well, that's a big question. I mean, I have a personal vision connected to where I am working that all the water all the waters, the streams and the drinking water that comes from our wells is pristine and that we are really a model watershed organization for the rest of the country. But um, I would really uh, hope that people embrace um, 
the idea that our climate is changing and that we really need, this is the time to step up for the future. Um, we're behind. Um, I think we have to be very proactive and I would, um, a very educated and thoughtful um, citizenship would really help turn things around. Cindy Aaron Clue, thanks for the work that you're doing and for being a part of our 21 series. Well, thank you. I'm very proud to be a part of it. Thank you. You can meet Cindy and the other extraordinary Jersey residents at myNJPBS.org backslash 21. And that's going to do it for us tonight, but make sure you check out Reporters Roundtable with senior correspondent David Cruz. This week, David talks with activist Katie Brennan, who is looking to break the culture of silence when it comes to the workplace non-disclosure agreements through the Speak Out Act. That's Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. Plus, on Chatbox this week, U.S. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona about his recent visit to New Jersey's public schools. That's Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 30 both on njpbs i'm raven santana for the entire nj spotlight news team thanks for being with us tonight have a great weekend and we'll see you back here on monday njm insurance group serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years horizon blue cross blue shield of new jersey an independent licensee of the blue cross and blue shield association and new jersey realtors the voice for real estate in new jersey more information is online at njrealtor.com. For more than 100 years, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients achieve their dreams. New Jersey Realtors live and work in cities, suburban neighborhoods, and shore communities, just like here in beautiful Asbury Park. No matter what your unique needs are, there's a New Jersey Realtor for you. Find your realtor at nj.realestate/find.